Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first Grand Rounds in 2022. I'm Christina Mangurian. I'm the Vice Chair for Diversity and Health Equity, and I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Dr. Matt Goldman, who's the Medical Director of Comprehensive Crisis Services in the San Francisco Department of Public Health. I actually first met Matt when he was a medical student here at UCSF in the UCSF UC Berkeley Joint Medical Program and have watched his career flourish since. He went and um, completed his residency um, and chief residency in psychiatry at Columbia University and then became a policy fellow at SAMHSA in the office of the chief medical officer. And then, of course, I had the pleasure of getting to work more closely with him in our public psychiatry fellowship where he graduated in June of 2020. After graduation, he's continued to excel and gain leadership roles, as I mentioned, at DPH and other associations, in addition to having a very adorable baby on this boy on the side. And um, Matt's primary area of research focuses on crisis services and suicide prevention. And he's actually the PI of a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant to evaluate the implementation of San Francisco's street crisis response team, which you'll hear more about today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goldman. And before we formally start, I love all the claps out there. It's nice that you have yourselves off, some of you off of uh, having your pictures. And before we formally start, there will be a Q&A session at around 9.20. So if you have questions for Dr. Goldman, please submit them via the public chat box. Or if you'd like to ask questions live, you can click on reactions and raise your hand. And when I call your name, um, the host will unmute you on the microphone. And that's actually a really nice thing if you feel comfortable doing that. So thank you. And I'm going to hand this over to Matt. Thank you so much, Christina. I really appreciate it and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, Happy New Year. The thing I was proudest about, about putting these slides together was that I put 2022 on the slide correctly instead of being stuck in last year. Um, so no, really an honor to get to present to you all. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. And so I'm going to be talking to you about crisis services. But before I jump into crisis services themselves, I think we have to do some framing about why why are we talking about mental health crisis services right now? And the long of short of it is that in many regards, our behavioral health systems are failing us. Increased suicide rates um, and overdoses continue. These have made headlines. Um, over 48,000 Americans died by suicide in 2019, um, 20 times as many adults that, uh, attempt suicide. Um, over 100,000 drug overdose deaths occurred in the United States um, uh, during the beginning part of COVID. And, um, and obviously these trends continue in really concerning ways. Also, criminal justice involvement of people who are experiencing mental illness is a major problem. A quarter of police-involved shooting deaths are linked to mental illness, half of which occur in the person's own home. Over 2 million people with serious mental illness are booked into jail each year, and the prevalence of mental health and substance use disorders in jails and prisons is three to four times that of the general population. Also, people with mental illness are incarcerated for twice as long and few receive the needed treatment. Um, emergency department boarding is a major issue, so systems feeling a lot of pressure in uh, emergency department settings where people with mental health and substance use disorders have longer wait times, including uh, increased ED utilization overall. And there's lack of outpatient mental health access and capacity where only 50% of adults with suicidal ideation plans or attempts report any contact with any mental health services in the previous year. And, and so clearly access is a problem. And you see right there in the middle, I included disparities because there are disparities across all of these different fundamental uh, structural barriers in our systems. So related to suicides, there was a study early in the pandemic that showed that um, in the state of Maryland, suicides halved among the white population, but doubled in the black population. Criminal justice involvement almost goes without saying that there are disparities in that setting. Um, one study in particular showed that non-Black minority former prisoners with serious mental illness had returned to prison significantly quicker than non-Black minorities without serious mental illness. Um, emergency department boarding, so there are longer emergency department wait times for non-Hispanic Blacks versus non-Hispanic whites, according to one study that was done. And with lack of access, um, uh, there are disparities that have increased over time. There was one study that looked between 2004 and 2011, 
for all uh, people identifying as Black, Hispanic, and Asian compared with the white population and use of any mental health care, any outpatient care, and any psychotropic medication in the past year. So clearly major issues. I added plus COVID here because COVID just complicates everything, exacerbates all of these challenges, exacerbates the underlying disparities. Um, and clearly, all of this leads to the statement, there is a need for parity in mental health crisis services. The same is for general health emergencies. And right now we're a long way off. A long way off. Um, one good note is that society is catching up. So there have been news headlines across pretty much every major uh, national publication acknowledging things like the New York Times opinion essay that said mental health crisis is not a crime. Um, ABC News covering specifically how sending mental health responders instead of police could save Black lives, so acknowledging the disparities piece. Um, you know, articles in the Washington Post and Vox and other settings um, describing specific programs. And right there in the middle, you see um, uh, Section Chief Simon Pang uh, with the San Francisco Fire Department standing next to um, uh, AMS-6 rig, but he has been instrumental in developing the street crisis response team, which I'll talk about in a bit. And um, there was a really nice uh, story written about him and NPR. So, you know, there, there really has been a societal acknowledgement that these are major issues that need to be addressed. Um, the question is, how do we address them? And so that's really what I'm going to be talking about today is, you know, if we're talking about alternatives to police response, if we're talking about decarceration or diversion from criminal legal settings, how do we actually get there? And um, a lot of the proposed solutions fall in this realm of the mental health crisis continuum. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, the history of crisis in the U.S. is an important and interesting one for us to frame some context around why are we talking about crisis services now. Um, 911 was first created in 1968. It was an act of Congress to establish 911 as a national emergency number. Previously, if you needed to call the police or the you know uh, fire department, you had to look in your phone book, and there was a different phone number for each region in the country. And so now, in 1968, they passed a law saying every single phone company is going to work towards establishing 911 as a common means of dispatching uh, all of those types of resources. Importantly, um, 911 does have a complicated history. Part of why 911 was established was actually um, uh, during around the time of the race riots. This was you know, the, uh, the, the time of major you know, civil unrest in the United States um, during the social justice movements. And, um, and one of the reasons that 911 was established was so that it was easier for people to call for police. And since the beginning of 911, there have been studies that have looked at usage of 911 and non-emergency usage, including increased rates of calling 911 on people of color, which of course is now a story that's been covered in the news countless times. Um, is something that even originated in the history of, of how 911 was established. And so I say that because there's, again, disparities even within this realm of crisis services and, and many um, factors, including, I mean, what I just described is frankly structural racism. We need to address that as we're establishing these new um, crisis systems. Um, also, the thing to say about 911 is it took decades to implement. So this was like a major effort. And when they started implementing 911, they already had emergency medical services and police departments and fire departments already functioning. And so 911 was the common number. On the mental health crisis side, we're trying to create a whole new system, whole new mechanism of dispatch, and a whole new resource to be able to respond and to be able to receive patients um, in a way that uh, has only existed in, in small pieces previously. In 1987, the crisis intervention team model was established, um, sometimes called the Memphis model. I'll talk about that in a little bit. In 2005 was when the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline was established by SAMHSA. Um, and this is 1-800-273-TALK, a common number that you often see at the end of news articles that talk about suicide. And that's a national network of, uh, of lifelines, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well. In 2011, the Zero Suicide Initiative um, was, uh, was convened by the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention um, to describe what are ways that health systems can try to implement top to bottom strategies to reduce suicide. 
And on the heels of that in 2016, the National Action Alliance again um, convened and created a report called Crisis Now. And this was really a turning point for crisis services because after zero suicide, when there is an acknowledgement, we need to really figure out how to address suicide prevention in a more robust way. Although of course, suicide rates continue to rise and we're still struggling with that. Um, there was an acknowledgement that once you identify that somebody might be experiencing some sort of suicidal crisis, there's not necessarily an obvious resource to be able to send that person or to provide that person. And so Crisis Now is acknowledging we need to create an actual system to respond to those who are in suicidal crisis. And since then, this concept has really expanded to this idea of the crisis continuum. In 2019, the Federal Communications Commission authorized that um, 980 would become the national number, a three-digit number, to contact the National Suicide Prevention. So rather than needing to remember 1-800-273-TALK, you can instead dial 988 from any phone. And you see in 2022, this year, July, that's going live. Um, and then in 2020 and 2021, there were a couple additional really important resource documents on crisis services in 2020 by SAMHSA, they released um, a national toolkit. Um, and in 2021, the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, formerly the National Council for Behavioral Health, um, released its uh, roadmap to the ideal crisis system. And both of those have been really foundational documents that have guided a lot of the conversation. So as you can see, there's a long history of kind of setting some of the path here, but this has really taken off in the last few years. Um, and and um, of course, also in 2020, um, COVID happened. Also in 2020, um, George Floyd was murdered. So there, there were many confluent events that have happened on this recent timeline to really push mental health crisis continuum forward into the national conversation. This is a great schematic of the Arizona crisis system. Um, credit here goes to my colleague, Margie Balfour, who's based in Tucson, Arizona. Arizona has a really robust crisis system and they really exemplify what is this vision of how a crisis continuum could work. And so she put together this diagram that I think is so helpful and I'm gonna walk you through it because it helps frame a lot of what I'm gonna discuss um, during the rest of my talk. The idea here is on the left, there's a person who's in crisis. Ideally, they would be able to contact a crisis line directly. Or if they call 911, that 911 line would not just have three boxes for police, fire, EMS, emergency medical services, but would have a fourth box for crisis, um, for a mental health type um, uh, presentation where 911 would be able to transfer those calls to a crisis line. And in Arizona, about 80% of calls to that crisis line are resolved on the phone. Um, that means providing support, um, you know, suicide hotline counseling, providing informational resources, making safety plans on the phone. Um, you know, that, that telephonic resolution of 80% of calls really helps um, you know, decrease the downstream flow to higher levels of care that might be required. For those that do need an in-person response, mobile crisis teams could be dispatched to go and meet that person where they are, or potentially if police happen upon somebody who's in a mental health crisis, they could also summon a mental health crisis team. And in Arizona, about 70% of crisis, um, uh, mobile crisis visits are resolved in the field. So they don't need to be transported. They can be seen in person, evaluated. The clinician that sees them can rest assured that, okay, there's not an immediate safety risk here. We have a plan. There's some sort of follow-up in place. Then they don't need additional transport to a higher level of care. For those 30% or so that do need transport to a crisis facility, um, they have dedicated crisis facilities. So rather than needing to bring people to an emergency department, which is not well equipped, you know, most places do not have a psychiatric emergency services like we do here at San Francisco General. Um, uh, they have dedicated crisis facilities in Arizona that are made for mobile crisis drop off and also police drop off or also walk ins. And what they find is that about 70% of people who self-present or who are dropped off at crisis facilities can be safely discharged to the community without needing to go to, again, to a higher level of care. They also have post-crisis wraparound services in Arizona. So about 85% remain stable in community-based care. And all of this leads to a decrease in use of jail resources, ED inpatient type settings, which of course that big blue arrow at the bottom says what we're all thinking. It's really important to prioritize settings that are less restrictive, more person-centered, more trauma-informed, and also less costly to the system overall. 
And that gray box there that says close collaboration with law enforcement equals pre-arrest diversion is a really important point that um, uh, it's not like this can happen in a vacuum. Police are still going to be involved in some of these calls. And so it's important for there to be an appropriate collaboration where there are um, uh, efficient and specific triage mechanisms in place so that when police are needed, they can be present. And when police are not needed, they can hand calls off or visits off to the appropriate mental health um, specialty resource. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk about each of these different components, some of the evidence base that supports each one, some cross-cutting issues, um, and then some uh, new research that we've been doing um, in this field. So first of all, for crisis call centers. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, as I've talked about, this is what's going to become 988, launched in January 2005. They answer about 2 million calls annually, although more recently, especially since COVID, it's increased to about 3 million. Um, this is a network of more than 170 crisis centers. They're overseen by a nonprofit called Vibrant Behavioral Health based in New York, and they're supported by federal grants from SAMHSA only to support the network. So SAMHSA grants support Vibrant to oversee this network of centers, but the call centers themselves only receive something between $2,500 to $5,000 a year from SAMHSA. So basically nothing. And so the centers are mostly self-functioning. They're either um, in California, there's a couple of counties that directly operate NSPL um, call centers. Um, these call centers can also be overseen by nonprofits, as is the case in San Francisco, where San Francisco Suicide Prevention, which has been around for decades and also operates other important resources like the HIV crisis line and um, their drug relapse crisis line. Um, they're now part of the Felton Institute, which is a community-based organization in San Francisco, um, and many other organizations of how National Suicide Prevention Lifeline members are organized. There's also the Veteran Crisis Line, and they get really good traffic, especially from male veterans who are a hard-to-reach population. Um, and then there's also a, a crisis chat and text feature, which the FCC just recently approved that 988 will also be required to receive both chat and text functionalities, um, which have been especially utilized by, um, by youth. There is really good evidence to support these crisis call centers. So Madeline Gould and George Califat and others um, were actually funded by SAMHSA to do evaluation of NSPL since early in its inception. And they published a bunch of studies in the mid 2000s that, um, that found that NSPL decreased suicidality during calls. A third to a half of callers are connected with mental health referrals. And callers said that a follow-up initiative stopped about 80% from killing themselves and kept 90% safe. The NSPL chat function um, is also been shown to be uh, quite effective. Two thirds reported that chat was helpful and half reported that um, they felt less suicidal after chatting with somebody through NSPL. And also, an initial study um, found that third-party callers to NSPL showed higher rates of requested transport to the emergency department. And what I mean by third-party are callers who are not self-calling, so it's not a first-party self-call, hi, I'm Matt, I'm having some suicidal thoughts, and I need support right now. Those calls are sort of the bread and butter of NSPL, and that's what um, these lifelines are really well built to be able to provide. Um, but these third party callers where, you know, somebody's uh, parent is calling about a child or, you know, a sister about her brother or something like that. Um, that when there are those types of third party calls, there's higher rates of requested transport. And the reason that's so important as a finding is because we're anticipating big changes ahead for crisis call centers in anticipation of 988. So when 988 goes live in July of this year, um, of course, there's expected to be a huge increase in volume. So you can see this graphic on the right that while NSPL call centers themselves are only receiving about 3 million calls, there's an additional 13 million annual calls that go to local county and state crisis lines and about 24 million calls that are going to 911. That's estimated to be about 10% of the 240 million calls that go to, um, to 911 annually, according to the National Emergency Number Association. And so there's a potential for 40 million crisis calls being within scope for what 988 is envisioned to be able to receive. Um, but it's more than just a potential tenfold increase in calls that we're anticipating. We're also expecting that there will be more calls to 988 requiring immediate rescue. 
requiring what I refer to as complex crisis triage, especially for those third party calls where it's not just that somebody's asking for self support to a suicide hotline, but rather that they're actually saying, I'm hearing voices or I'm seeing somebody who looks like they're in distress on the street or all kinds of different crisis presentations. And that's a whole different can of worms for crisis call centers to be able to field. They will, of course, still need to do their bread and butter of suicide hotline support. Also, um, you know, peer support is a really important factor for a lot of crisis lines, um, including the California Warm Line is one that's staffed mostly by peers. Um, and then also information only. So like in California, um, statewide, there's a mandate that every county have a behavioral health access line. Here in San Francisco, we call it the Behavioral Health Access Center, or BHAC, which is um, operated by the Department of Public Health. And there's, you know, all of these different calls are likely to funnel into 988 which in San Francisco is gonna mean the suicide prevention um, lifeline, the SF suicide prevention. And so there's gonna be a lot of need for uh, coordinating these types of responses um, within local settings and ensuring that um, as 988 changes the caller type that all of these different settings are prepared. And I will say there has not been research that's been done on this expanded vision of crisis call centers. The work that has been done has been on NSPL suicide specific type settings, uh, but there's definitely a major need for research on these expanded visions of um, 988 type crisis lines. Okay, mobile crisis. Um, there are a lot of flavors of mobile crisis. You hear about one mobile crisis team, you've heard about one mobile crisis team. Um, the first mobile crisis was established as early as the 1930s in Amsterdam. As of June 2020, at least 34 states have mobile teams, although if you operate statewide, I am confident that by now that number has ballooned, it just hasn't been studied, although we are um, working on developing a national survey of mobile crisis teams that we plan on launching next week. Um, there are various compositions of mobile teams. Typically it's one to two clinicians, most commonly a behavioral health clinician plus minus um, uh, somebody like a psychiatric technician or somebody who can um, be in an assisting role. Um, there are co-responder or ride-along models where behavioral health clinicians are paired with a police officer. A very well-known example of that is in Los Angeles, the STARS program. The CAHOOTS model has gotten a lot of attention nationally, where a behavioral health clinician is paired with an emergency medical technician or a paramedic. And some programs also include peers, including here in San Francisco. So um, this three crisis response team, which I'll talk about in a bit, includes um, a behavioral health clinician, a paramedic, and also a peer specialist. We also, the program that I directly oversee, Comprehensive Crisis Services, is a mobile crisis team where we also have various pairings of different training, um, including behavioral health clinicians, uh, nurses, psychologists, health workers, um, and we also have psychiatrists who work on our team, um, including a couple wonderful PGY4 residents in the adult psychiatry program who are rotating with us this year. Um, the crisis intervention team model, so I mentioned this, began in the 1980s in Memphis, Tennessee, often called the Memphis model. It was actually created in response to a police shooting of a person who's experiencing a mental health crisis. And so, you know, for a long time, we've seen mental health crises intersecting with law enforcement in really negative ways. Most recently, of course, there's Daniel Prude, which happened in, um, in upstate New York. And that was a, a real, I think, pivot moment uh, where we acknowledged we need to have alternate responses to law enforcement for many of these types of scenarios. Um, CIT is an early approach that was developed. So about 3,000 jurisdictions in the United States across almost every state have implemented CIT, which typically includes a 40 hour training for self selected officers. Um, it's been associated with increased use of verbal redirection, higher likelihood of referral to treatment and lower likelihood of arrest. So there are positive outcomes with CIT models. Um, the one thing that I'll say is full CIT really envisions that there's a crisis system that's there ready to receive people from law enforcement with quick and easy access, 24 seven availability, no wrong door, really kind of what I was describing with the Arizona model where there's those dedicated crisis facilities and close collaboration between mental health and law enforcement resources. Um, that often is not available in settings that have implemented CIT. Most often CIT includes that 40 hour training. Um, and so uh, fidelity to this model is something that um, is, is important to keep in mind when considering its efficacy. 
Um, there is also some evidence for mobile crisis. Most studies that have been done are single site quasi experimental studies. So um, uh, either uh, you know, case control, um, there's been a couple of propensity score match studies, there's been um, uh, some uh, time series studies, and they're mostly focusing on post crisis service utilization. So things like decreased hospitalization, increased community based mental health services um, that are received after a mental health crisis has responded to by a mobile team, reduced ED utilization, especially among youth. That was one study that was done. Another recent study, though, actually showed that there's increased emergency department utilization among people who are accessing mobile crisis services. And so most of these studies have, have focused on those types of outcomes. There's also a couple studies that looked at um, arrests. So one showed reduced short-term arrests, but not long-term jail bookings for people following mobile crisis encounters. Um, and then also significant cost savings due to diversion from inpatient admissions. So you can imagine how mobile teams might save um, money for the system overall. That said, there's not a lot of work that's been done to really look at what are the ideal clinical models for how um, a, a mobile crisis clinician in the field should be doing triage, should be de-escalating, should be um, you know, ensuring uh, a connection to specific resources depending on the type of clinical presentation, be it a suicidal crisis or a psychotic episode or a substance relapse or, or whatever the case may be. Um, so definitely more room for uh, research in that area as well. And then finally, crisis facilities. So again, there are many flavors of crisis facilities. And this table, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, and I'm happy to share my slides so you can look at this more. But basically, this is a way of saying crisis stabilization units, which are often invoked, really varies depending on state nomenclature and licensing and all kinds of regulatory um, uh, issues. Um, there are different models, so 23-hour observation, subacute, which are sort of like short-term inpatient-like stays, living room models, sobering centers, which of course we have in San Francisco, including both an alcohol sobering center and also the new Soma Rise drug sobering center that's opening um, soon, and then also uh, crisis residential type settings. And so a lot of different examples of programs, and they vary based on the type of acuity that they can accept, whether they're locked or not, are police dropping people off directly in these settings. Um, I will say peers are essential across all of these settings and, and um, play a really important role. Evidence for crisis facilities is mixed, it's scattered. Um, so crisis stabilization units are 23-hour observations, which are uh, really the kind of model that's proliferating across the United States right now, have been minimally studied. Psychiatric emergency services have been much more extensively studied, and there's a whole field of emergency psychiatry. And so I think the assumption is that most of the learnings from emergency psychiatry will apply to these types of crisis stabilization units. That said, I would like to see some studies that do look specifically at these settings to really understand best practices, models, and ensure fidelity to evidence-based approaches. Um, empath units, so these are emergency psychiatric assessment, treatment, and healing settings, um, have been studied um, using pre-post analysis. And they did show that there was a reduction in admissions, reduction in 30-day return to the emergency department, and reduction in emergency department boarding time by as much as two thirds as well as the 60% increase in 30-day follow-up care. So some good um, models out there. Um, empath is a little different from crisis facilities as we conventionally know them. I'm not gonna get into those details, but, um, but anyways, there's a lot of different ways of approaching crisis facilities. Where there is some of the most robust evidence is actually in crisis residential. So crisis residential settings tend to be um, more like step-down units. So in San Francisco, we have what we call acute diversion units. Most of them are operated by the Progress Foundation. Um, and these are um, settings that are evidence-based. They um, have done uh, research that shows greater client satisfaction than traditional inpatient settings, also shows lower cost, and shows that you know, it, it's a way to at the least decrease the utilization of acute and inpatient type settings. Um, there are uh, also peer respite models, um, especially including the living room model where there are settings that are um, less professional staff present and are more operated by peers. And I think that they're very very promising models, but again, more research needs to be done in those areas. Not, not much has actually looked at those rigorously. Um, okay, 
Next, so I've talked about all the different components of the continuum. So we're thinking about call centers, we're thinking about mobile teams, we're thinking about facilities. There are also some cross-cutting topics that need to be considered. And I'm gonna start with what I think is one of the very most important ones, which is the impact of crisis services on equity. There's a quote here that I'm gonna read in full because um, Dr. Sarah Vinson and her colleague, Dr. Dennis are brilliant. Um, they, they said in a paper um, that was published in Psychiatric Services, understanding a problem is a prerequisite to addressing it. For the mental health care system to play its role in remedying the incarceration of a population that is disproportionately Black and Latinx, the extent of racial inequities in this population's mental health treatment must be fully characterized. However, the system's current functioning does not support such understanding. So really poignantly stated that we don't have the research to really understand either how our system is currently functioning or how these future models might actually impact equity. Equity analyses um, can be conducted in various ways. One very basic way is to stratify metrics by race and ethnicity in order to examine the impact on disparities. Um, also strategies that can be done to really promote um, uh, 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 ensuring that you know, existing disparities are addressed and dismantled, include providing concerted trainings on best practices um, to collect sociodemographic data in the setting of crisis. Often in a crisis setting, people are experiencing a really heightened state and it might feel uncomfortable to be asking what's your you know, self-identified race and ethnicity. That said, this data is so important that there are ways to do that in ways that are person-centered and thoughtful. Um, and it requires a concerted effort to do so. Also, it's important to ensure that disparities and equity um, are tracked as part of all quality and evaluation efforts. So um, you know, really prioritizing collection of race and ethnicity data to then be able to stratify metrics is essential. One example, a recent study of a co-responder team, this was a pairing of a clinician and a police officer, um, really demonstrated this. So they found that there was no overall change in long-term risk of justice involvement. I mentioned that earlier when talking about mobile teams, but they did actually find that incarceration was significantly reduced among Black co-responder team recipients. So let's think about that for a minute. Overall, for the whole population, people who got this co-responder team did not have an overall risk of justice involvement. But when they looked specifically by racial ethnic group and they looked at the black population that had seen this co-responder team, they found that it actually did decrease incarceration. And so from a policy standpoint, you might then deduce, well, if we wanna focus specifically on a population that experiences vastly higher rates of incarceration, then might a program like this actually promote anti-racism? Might this be a mechanism that can address some of the structural disparities where, okay, even if the overall long-term risk of justice involvement for the whole population is not benefited, we might still want to fund this because it is benefiting a priority population that otherwise experiences disparity. So I think that's a really powerful finding. Um, another example from the same study found that um, uh, there is more likely to be emergency medical services contact at six and 12 months across the whole population, but these trends were likely driven by white co-responder team recipients and not observed in the black population. So again, they found this finding, but it's driven, you know, so this higher utilization of emergency medical services following contact with the co-responder team. If it's the white recipients of this program that are driving that, that then at least lets you question, well, so what's going on with the Black population? Why aren't they contacting EMS as much? Is contacting EMS more a uh, positive thing if people are truly in crisis and do need support and they weren't able to get um, crisis responder team response in that moment? Is that potentially a negative outcome as it's often viewed as a reutilization metric because that person's not getting connected to care in the way that we wish they were? A lot more to understand there, but it, at least acknowledging that there might be racial disparities in that finding really helps inform some of the potential uh, responses to, uh, to these models. Another major issue is post-crisis linkages. So post-crisis wraparound services are um, envisioned to link patients to long-term treatment, avoid reutilization of crisis and other acute services, prevent future encounters with law enforcement, and also address underlying social determinants of health, including housing, transportation, food. That is all a tall order. There have been a couple studies that have looked at various approaches to linkages, but this is something that 
really needs to be investigated further in each of these different areas. Um, some models that have been implemented include uh, that these post-crisis wraparound services can be provided by behavioral health programs, including peer navigators, also law enforcement-based case management, community paramedics, um, et cetera. Peer specialists, so I've mentioned peers a bunch of times and um, um, they deserve a slide of their own um, just to, to focus on, on some specific work that's been done in this area. So peer support specialists working with EDs has shown promising recovery related outcomes. Um, they have been shown to be effective at communicating with people who are in a mental health crisis. Um, and, uh, and also they've been effective at intervening in what I think of as a cyclical sort of revolving door nature that often we observe in emergency department admissions for people who are experiencing mental health crisis. There's a lot of potential here that hasn't been studied as carefully. So um, potential to decrease emergency department um, boarding by patients with mental illness, decrease negative or adverse outcomes due to crisis, like the use of restraints or emergency medications. I think there's a lot more to observe and how peers might really help improve um, our crisis services overall. And the last piece um, to consider here is how involuntary treatment relates to crisis services. Um, there's not much that's been done specifically on involuntary treatment by you know, mobile crisis teams. So for example, mobile teams placing 5150s or things like that. In general, some work that's been done on involuntary hospitalization has shown that the greatest risk is among people who previously have been involuntarily hospitalized, people who have a psychotic disorder diagnosis, and also people who are experiencing economic deprivation either at the individual or the population level, so either their neighborhood or the individual themselves. Um, that said, our data on involuntary treatment are really poor. So uh, there was a study published in Psych Services that found that there were usable counts only in 25 states. California was one of them. Um, in the 24 states that um, had fully usable population, which were representing about half of the US population, there were almost 600,000 emergency involuntary detentions in 2014. The rate of detentions per population vastly differed. In Connecticut, it was 29 per 100,000. In Florida, it was 966 per 100,000. So over a 30-fold difference in how involuntary emergency detentions were used, um, which is emblematic of the reality that involuntary hold laws are really different state by state. Some are as short as 24 hours, others um, like in New York, an involuntary hold can get you as long as up to 60 days following the initial hold. Of course, there's always judicial review, um, but still very different um, approaches to, to how this is done. Um, from 2012 to 2016, there was shown to be some increase in, uh, in uh, involuntary treatment, um, and, uh, and likely those trends are continuing to increase as uh, crisis continues to increase in the population. Um, but the, the punchline here is public tracking of civil commitment is needed for oversight, but really complicated by things like privacy concerns, decentralized systems in mental health care, and variable commitment criteria across jurisdictions. So with that, some early research findings. So I am really lucky to have a wonderful team. Um, it's a collaboration um, between our core team who's funded both by the Robert Johnson Foundation and also the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, um, collaborators from the UCSF Prize Center. Uh, we have students, residents, and fellows who are all involved in this work and also many collaborators at DPH. We've also been fortunate to get some really important input from people with lived experience in mental health crisis from a range of communities community partners. And the main project that we've been working on is a study of the street crisis response team. And um, the, the way that we structure this analysis is we have three aims. So first of all, street crisis response team, SCRT as I'll call it for short, this is a 911 dispatched co-responder model. So I mentioned earlier, there's a behavioral health clinician who is contracted through Health Rate 360, a paramedic through the San Francisco Fire, and a peer specialist through RAMS. Um, they respond in this red van that you see the picture of here. Um, this program is part of Mental Health San Francisco, which is, is a major uh, mayoral initiative, um, and it's funded by Proposition C funds, so um, our county, our home funds. 
And um, what we wanted to do is to um, evaluate this program in as robust a way as possible with the data that we had. Now we're lucky in San Francisco because we have amazing data infrastructure. Um, uh, the CCMS system, the coordinated care management system, which was largely um, uh, envisioned and developed by the late and great Maria X. Martinez um, has enabled many studies of our system here in San Francisco and enabled this study to be possible because we needed pre-intervention data in order to be able to study these outcomes and only by having that existing robust infrastructure were we able to actually look at this stuff. Um, so we're doing an interrupted time series analysis. We're looking at four main post-crisis outcomes. Um, those include outpatient mental health or substance use service utilization, um, acute service utilization, reutilization, so that means returning to an ED, psych emergency, or other crisis services, assessment for supportive housing or other long-term housing placement, and then jail entry. Um, we're also in AIM2 doing an equity analysis. So just what I described before, that we're stratifying our interrupted time series by race and ethnicity to look at whether prior to implementation of SCRT, were there any existing disparities? And then post-implementation of SCRT, were those disparities perpetuated? Were they resolved or dismantled in some way? Um, and, and looking really specifically at how um, this program has impacted the overall population. We're also doing mixed methods. So we're, um, AIM-3 is using qualitative interviews with people who received services from SCRT. Our original intent was to use a qual-quant sampling frame to identify people for interviews who had had a variety of different outcome pairings based on the quantitative analysis. However, uh, barriers defining participants made this really basically impossible. It, it, it's very challenging um, to find the the population that we're interested in interviewing who are predominantly people with serious mental illness, often co-occurring substance use, and almost all of whom are experiencing housing instability. And so um, uh, that was a practical consideration, but the qualquant sampling frame is important just in terms of how we had envisioned the protocol. Um, our semi-structured interview guides, so we're asking about the description of their experience, but we're not just focusing on, you know, client satisfaction. We really want to understand what was somebody's engagement in services pre-SCRT? What did post-crisis linkage look like for that person, if any? And overall, how did their SCRT experience relate to their personal goals? And in particular, we want to understand are these quantitative outcomes, these metrics that are so often promoted in systems, post-crisis episode you know, linkage or outpatient routine care utilization as a proxy for linkage, post-crisis episode acute service reutilization, you know, these things that are thought of as, well, you want linkage and you don't want reutilization, right? That's sort of like the general idea. Is that actually aligned with people's goals? There's a lot of people who don't ever want to see a psychiatrist because they have had so many traumatic experiences in psych emergency services that they are not going to engage in outpatient treatment, and that can be very aligned with their goals. Um, and so we want to um, understand some of those nuances as we interpret our quantitative findings um, to be able to get a richer understanding of what's actually happening with this population. Um, we're currently coding transcripts using a hybrid of grounded theory and thematic analysis type um, approaches, and our results are anticipated in late 2022. Um, another study, this is separate from the Robert Louis Johnson Foundation uh, funded work, um, is work that I've partnered with some folks in Arizona. So I mentioned that Arizona has a robust crisis system. Part of why it's robust is because their Medicaid pays for a lot of the crisis continuum in a way that's quite unique across the United States. So we leveraged that Medicaid data and took a year of their data looking at adults 18 to 64. And we examined if a mobile crisis, crisis facility, emergency department, or inpatient service was followed by a higher intensity service within 72 hours. And what we found was that only 40% or so, 41% remained in crisis only settings. So in a system that has really invested in mobile crisis and crisis facilities, of the 127,000 total crisis episodes that happened in Arizona that were for Medicaid beneficiaries in Arizona in this one year period, um, there was a real ability to keep people in lower cost, shorter stay, less restrictive type environments. 
Um, we also found that about half of people who, uh, who received any mobile crisis service, so about of the 30,000 people who started in mobile crisis and then either stayed mobile crisis only or went on to go to a crisis facility, ED or inpatient type setting within 72 hours, that only about 50% actually had no further services within 72 hours. That is different from what I mentioned earlier about Arizona, that in Arizona's experience clinically, 70% of crises are resolved in the field. Here we're saying that only about 50% remain in the field. And then uh, the other 50% actually do, do go on to a higher setting of care. And so what that then highlights for us is, well, so what's the delta between this 50% and the 70%? How do we understand what's happening there? It might be because Medicaid population is overall higher acute and requires more of these intensive services, but it might also be the perspective that we're looking at. So here we're looking at Medicaid claims. So we're seeing services that are actually billed for and utilized. On the other end, the 70% resolution in the field was based on the clinician's disposition. So that was clinically documented. What did the clinician determine was the appropriate outcome? There might then be some share of that population that within 72 hours does end up presenting to a crisis facility, ED or inpatient. And so we're currently actually working on developing a study that is gonna link these Medicaid claims to those clinical records so that we'll be able to see what is that population where the mobile crisis team believes that they're resolving the crisis in the field, but then those clients end up actually needing higher levels of care. And that'll then help with you know, developing best practices and informing models of mobile crisis response. We're also doing an analysis of the Georgia crisis access crisis and access life uh, um, line. This is a, a statewide crisis resource in Georgia where they actually have a very robust both call center and also mobile team functionality statewide. This is a, a study that's funded by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention where I have a, a young investigator innovation grant. Um, and uh, this is just some preliminary findings. I'm a little short on time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna race through this, but um, the goal here is to use these statewide clinical records to look at, um, at referral decision-making on the part of crisis clinicians. And we also have an additional study that's currently um, under review by NIMH in order to examine suicidal adults and also people with co-occurring substance use disorders, and also to conduct a cluster analysis of people who are in crisis by, um, by basically plugging in this large statewide data set and using a latent class analysis or a cluster analysis to see how clusterings of the population might shape um, in order to inform in a data-driven way what are common crisis phenotypes that are presenting to the statewide um, crisis call line, which in many ways is representative of what a 988 type line is going to be like. And then finally, in terms of studies um, here in California, we have a, a good example of a lot of natural experiments to study. So California SB 82, Senate Bill 82, funded a series of grants called the Triage Grants, which allowed for Mental Health Services Act funds to go towards county-based um, crisis programs. And so there's an evaluation team based at UC Davis and also UCLA um, that is evaluating these programs. And that's a good example of, you know, as nationally as these programs pop up all over the place, um, these are some really tremendous opportunities to be able to understand more about these different types of models. So in my last couple of minutes here, just to talk about future direction. So first of all, there are many unique challenges of crisis services research and evaluation. There are so many topics. You heard me say many times more research needs to be done. And so where do we even start? There's incomplete data on race ethnicity that's needed for equity studies. There are minimal linkages between relevant databases, inconsistent billing and quality reporting, which leads to limited administrative data. There's limited data on non-hospital field-based settings like emergency medical services or mobile crisis type settings, and also involuntary hold data, as I mentioned. There's also a lot of siloing between state and county health officials and academic partners. Here in San Francisco, we're lucky because DPH and UCSF work so closely together, but that's not the case in most places. There's also difficulty of generalizing results in implementation research and fidelity to evidence-based models and a lack of mental health services funding. Um, research funding from NIMH and others. 
Um, this is a table that summarizes the many gaps in crisis research. I'm going to skip going through that. Um, this is a slide that really highlights how we have cobwebs all over our current data infrastructure at the call center level. So thinking about 988 NSPL call centers, 911 um, public safety answering point dispatch type data, other crisis call lines, our mobile data, as I mentioned, between mobile crisis, EMS, and police reports are all quite fragmented fragmented and difficult to link. Our facilities data, crisis facilities, ED hospital, EHRs, jail bookings are all quite disparate. And some of these cross-cutting data sources like benefits eligibility, insurance claims, uh, more social determinants type data, and also death data, and the need to collect race and ethnicity data throughout to inform equity analyses. There are so many needs to invest locally in developing data infrastructure and linkages, even beyond what we're fortunate to have here in San Francisco and especially in other settings. Um, there's a need for more sophisticated approaches to measurement. So a lot of measurement focuses on descriptive measures. So counting the number of teams and beds or calls and visits. Some have looked at performance measures, so a, a little bit more meaningful where they're looking at response times or duration of visits. Um, but as we go further down these more meaningful, but also more difficult to measure type metrics like process measures that are looking at calls transferred to 911, linkages to routine care, reutilization, involuntary hold rate, and also outcome measures. So true outcomes like suicide rates, overdose rates, symptom reduction, client satisfaction. These are all important to capture and being done in disparate ways. Again, I mentioned equity analyses here. And I mentioned benchmarks because that's a really important concept that, you know, if we're thinking about reutilization, for example, I mentioned this a little earlier, is reutilization going to be 0% in an ideal world? Well, probably not. As clinicians, we all know, when you tell somebody, you know, after working on a safety plan with them, you know, what are your return precautions? One of the main things is, if you're experiencing a crisis, please call us back, please come to the emergency room. You know, we want people to re-engage in care if they're in crisis. So what is that benchmark where if services or systems are functioning in an effective way that they're able to meet the needs of the population? Um, what is a rate of reutilization where it's too high, where the system is failing people and not actually linking them to appropriate services so that they're then reutilizing because that's the only option that they have. That concept is called benchmarking and that's something that we need a lot of in this space. And so lastly, this, this last slide is um, just to summarize strategies that are needed to advance crisis services research, something that I'm hopeful that many of you might engage in. Um, there's a need to develop a crisis research agenda to address the many gaps, to advocate for mandates and funding for evaluation in state and uh, federal bills, to identify strategies to engage academic partners and seek grant funding, sharing best practices for implementation science methods to study real world models, um, we need to share best practices also for obtaining, linking, and analyzing complex multi-sector data. Um, there's a real opportunity to align research with quality improvement and define consensus crisis metrics and benchmarks, leveraging big data for informatics and population-based approaches, and then also promoting research opportunities within our communities. So with that, that was a whirlwind tour. Sorry, <laughs> I went a couple of minutes over, um, but looking forward to your questions and the conversation. Excellent. Excellent. No, great job. And um, it was wonderful having you help us look through the very all the complexity of this. And so I'll I'll ask one of these questions and it was VHASF had um, asked it. So I don't know who the person is, but it's one of the first questions up on top. And they say, basically, you know, this is this is really important. Um, at the same time, this seems like a society level problem. Mm -hmm. Should we not keep the policy focus on things like child tax credit, other opportunities if we really want to shift the curve? How do we avoid supporting the perception that this is primarily an issue of limited clinical care when more likely it's embedded in our economic, social, and cultural structures and expectations? Yeah, I completely agree. I would just say I don't think that it's a zero-sum game. I don't think it's either or. I think it's both. Um, there is a lot of people who are getting police responses who are in mental health crisis and have negative outcomes. And of course, we need to address the underlying social determinants. 
that's going to take many years and a lot of hard work. And I think that working closely together and partnership between these different systems needs to be done. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the law enforcement diversion side on developing an appropriate and robust crisis continuum. So, so I completely agree. There's so many intersections and all of that needs to be well described. Um, but yeah, I, I think my, my takeaway is that I think we need to do both and there, I think there's enough resources for us to do both. Got it. And then I'm going to, um, Charles Berman, I tried to see if he would like to um, ask this, but he had two SCRT questions. So okay. first, is there any evidentiary basis for why SCRT has a behavioral health clinician, paramedic, and peer? It seems like a great model, but very resource intensive. Um, once paramedics can write 5150s, could we phase out BH? clinicians without major clinical sacrifice in order to save more money and hire more of these teams. This is coming from a social worker. Yeah, so I think you're referring to a couple things there. So, um, and hi, Charlie. <laughs> nice to see you here. Thanks for joining. Um, so uh, really good question. So first of all, uh, the evidentiary basis for all mobile crisis models, as I described, has not been established. There have not been head-to-head -head studies that look at a cahoots-esque model versus a behavioral health clinician-only model versus a police co-responder model. We don't know yet which of these models is best. We should know. We should study that. But absent that data, a lot of systems, you know, and this is a political moment, and so there's a lot of motivation and um, funding to support these new models. They're saying, well, we're not going to wait for years to figure out what's the best model in order to implement something that we're acknowledging needs to happen now. We're going to implement these new models. And so, um, so CAHOOTS has been really popular, and SCRT is based on a CAHOOTS-like model in its co-response. Um, I think you're referring to um, the recent uh, Board of Supervisors ordinance that was signed into law in San Francisco that authorizes paramedics to write 5150s. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in terms of how that's going to go, I really, uh, I, I can't say <laughs> that I, I, I think there's, it's an interesting question, but, um, but uh, it, as far as you know, how that might impact models like SCRT, um, I don't think that I don't think that we can you know really know at this point. It's it's still very early on in in all of those sort of proceedings. Yeah, which is interesting. Why you're doing the studies you're doing? You know, I think there's going to be a lot of really interesting information that'll come out from the qualitative data. Yeah. So then we've got two related questions um, from Trope, and um, from, so his question or her question is: Any data on how many crisis calls and or ED self presentations in San Francisco could be resolved simply with increasing shelter beds or housing? And then uh, another person said, yes, in addition, how about sobering centers? Um, how about safe injection sites um, uh, linked to substance use treatments prevention? Yeah, great questions. I assume that's Alex Trope. Nice to see you here. Um, uh, is there data there? Um, the data has not been examined specifically for that purpose, as far as I'm aware, uh, but it's a great question. So, you know, the um, some of the data that has been discussed as part of the motivation for having SCRT be 911 dispatched, and this has been presented at Mental Health SF's implementation working group, um, is on 911 calls that are for people who are in some sort of mental health crisis. Crisis. Those those are often coded by police codes as 800 calls, um, and there's as many as depending on how exactly you cut it with 800 calls and other types of wellness check calls and other codings. There's anywhere between 25,000 to 50,000 calls annually that go to 911 and then are responded to by the police that might benefit from a mental health type response. Um, maybe needing a mental health co-response, exactly what fraction of that would relate to shelter, housing, homelessness. I don't think that that's characterized in those call logs. Um, uh, and in terms of specifically to the sobering centers, so the sobering centers are a really, you know, um, a prominent model and certainly something that San Francisco is invested in. Um, but I don't actually, I'm, I'm less of an expert on the sobering centers as, as far as they go in San Francisco. So I'm not sure about those data in particular. Okay. 
now we have, I think we have time for one last question. This is from Barclay Stone. And um, she said, thank you so much for your talk. And then was saying, she was curious about the role of the 911 dispatcher in transferring the calls to SCRT. It seems like a crucial role to even get folks to SCRT in the first place. So could you describe that a little? Yeah, it's such an important point. So um, in San Francisco, if you want SCRT to come respond to what you perceive as a crisis that might benefit from an SCRT specialty response, um, there is no way to specifically request SCRT. And that's for a reason, because we have 911 operators who receive all different variety of calls, and they are using their triage protocols to get SCRT to the appropriate types of calls that really are, are well matched to that type of call. And so when you call 911, and I actually myself have called 911 to request SCRT and had this experience myself because I saw somebody who was in crisis and I was like, I think I know what SCRT is appropriate for. I'm going to call SCRT. And it was nerve wracking to just call 911 and say, I'm seeing somebody in crisis. I was worried. Did I just call the cops on somebody? Mm -hmm. SCRT came. They did a great job. I think, you know, there are coverage considerations. Are there always an SCRT unit available? We need to make sure that we're having, um, you know, somebody respond as quickly as possible. There, there's a lot of sort of details there, but I will say that um, that 911 operators in San Francisco are very well trained and effective at identifying calls that are going to be appropriate for an SCRT response. Well, that's great to know. That's great to know. So I know we're out of time. I want to thank you so much for presenting. Is it okay with you if I share your email in the chat in case yeah, please i've got it on the slide here great uh, oh yeah. great perfect perfect i didn't i missed it so i'll put it in the chat too in case people have other questions i really appreciate it you did a fantastic job and i'm so grateful for all the work that you're doing to help the people in san francisco so um thank you so much and thanks everybody for being here yeah thank you for your attention really appreciate it